Alcohol fortification, very important. Distillation is uh, a byproduct of fermentation. It is used as a stabilizing component, certainly for shipping. If you wanted to ship something out, you want to make sure you didn't have returns on your products, what would you do? You put a bunch of alcohol in it, and guess what? Voila, the product is stable. Alcohol is really important because it's a dynamizer. This is a word I love to use, but it dynamizes the floor. So the floor loves to eat alcohol. So by the addition of alcohol up to a certain point, you really dynamize the floor, which is awesome because then you create film that prevents oxidation. The other thing that they invent is fractional blending, which allows the homogenization of the must. It becomes one wine so that when you order it one year, it always tastes the same. It also complexifies and you add age to the blend. And again, floor dynamizer. So you're constantly adding new wine to the older wine, which means you're adding nutrients and the floor loves the nutrients and it feeds on that. So this fractional blending is one of the key things that defines cherry in the future. Finally, we should talk about terroir. When we think about terroir in current winemaking terms, we think about the sand, the earth. So Albariza is that main sort of high calcium soil that allows for the water to be held. You've got clay, which is used for lesser varieties, not Palomino, which is the main grape of sherry. And then less interesting soils are sand, which are soil plots that are close to obviously the waters and things like that. Uh, one of the things we haven't talked about is pagos. Pagos are, are essentially vineyard sites. Over 200 years ago, there were over 180 different vineyard sites. They were identified, they have different soils, exposures, altitudes, and some of these are still in existence today, and we're digging these up right now, and they're so fascinating. Pagos like Marchanudo is made famous by Fino Innocente. You've got the Pagos of Belbaina, of Miraflores, all these different Pagos with different exposures and closeness to the ocean. Climate is really important, obviously, in Jerez you have this very temperate area because of the influence of the Atlantic Ocean. But Jerez is actually a warmer climate. You're more interior. And the Pagos and the vineyard sites around the town of Jerez tend to be more suited for sort of bigger, broader style of wines, which makes total sense. But San Lucar and El Puerto, which are part of the Sherry Triangle, those are much cooler climate areas because you really have the influence of the Atlantic Ocean because they are literally right on the water. The other part to really talk about if we talk about terroir is to talk about floor. The floor is activated by a wind called the Poniente. So you have two major winds in the area. You've got the Poniente, which is a westerly wind. It activates the floor in the spring and in the fall, it is a wet, humid air. Then you have the Levante, which comes in from the eastern part, and that is a much drier, hotter, really unpleasant air that has no benefits other than, I guess, drying the grapes. Within floor, we need to talk about Saccharomyces. This is a yeast that is not the same yeast that's responsible for fermentation. This is Saccharomyces cerevisiae. It is active in the Sherry Triangle, which is defined by these three cities, San Lucar, El Puerto, and Jerez. And it needs a certain temperature range to really be active. And that temperature range is 64 to 68 degrees Fahrenheit. That's when it's really perfect. That's why the floor is most active in the springtime and in the fall. Once the temperature is adequate, the yeast cells float from the bottom up to the top of the surface. They start to breathe in the oxygen and they start to feed off the nutrients. It covers the totality of the surface during these time periods all throughout the region and it prevents oxidation. Once the temperature range changes, in some parts, the floor sort of dissipates. In other parts, like in San Lucar, it may stay around all year round. It just may be a thinner veil. It feeds off the oxygen and the nutrients that are in the wine. When the wine is first made, you've got all the, the natural sugars, the natural properties that are in there. It converts the ethanol into what are called aldehydes, the aromatic components. So it eats alcohol. It breathes the oxygen. That gives it life and it continues doing this through the whole cycle. It consumes everything in its path, including volatile acidity. So it is an amazing protector of wines that prevents wines from turning into vinegar. Yeast cells eventually break down when that temperature range isn't there, and they float down to the bottom of the barrel where they create a unique flavor profile due to autolysis. 
Continuing the discussion of terroir, what's really important is to talk about fractional blending. During fractional blending, you're taking younger wine and you're putting it in with older wine, so you're adding nutrients and you're invigorating or dynamizing the floor. You're giving it more nutrition. It's a really important part of not only homogenizing the must, but actually creating the nutrients so that the floor continues in existence. Fractional blending is a very complicated method of creating a unified style, but it's also a method that creates a very complex product and it's also a method that creates qualities so that the floor can be maintained. Everybody knows what the sherry sort of soleras look like. They're basically styled in pyramids. And essentially the first wine, which is called the Sobre Tabla, goes into the top barrel and that refills the subsequently older wine. And so what you're doing is you're constantly giving new nutrients and letting the floor continue to thrive even if some of those barrels might have four-year-old wines. But what's important to note is that there are different types of fractional blending. In San Lucar, the fractional blending is not the same as in Jerez. In San Lucar, you can have up to 16 classes, and these classes are essentially like Criaderas. They are all divided up into these pyramidal sort of structures, and each one of them is a different age of wine. So the Sobre Tabla might all be together in a series of nine barrels. Before it, that wine is passed on to the next class, it's actually all blended together from the top row to the bottom row and then thrown in to the second older wine. Why? Because they want to blend the wine that's less evolved, maybe at the bottom where it's cooler, with wines at the top, which, which is maybe more evolved. And of course, that wasn't complex enough. You have other areas like Chipiona where Cesar Florido uses different parts of his bodegas. He has three or four bodegas in town and the bodega that's closest to the Atlantic Ocean, what he does is he ages his youngest wines there so that they have the full inflection of the floor really growing. Once the floor is really active and it's spent two to three years there, it gets moved into a slightly more interior winery where it can start sort of complexifying and doesn't need that really cool climate. And then wines, for example, that he makes into Olorosos or his sweet wines, Muscatels, are actually aged in the interior part of, of Chipiona, where he has the sort of warmer climate, outdoor kind of bodega. So a little bit of a different concept. That's essentially fractional blending. Fractional blending adds complexity, and in both the regions, it's used in different ways to create different types of ideas. Lastly is the bodegas, because the bodega, we were talking about terroir, the bodega is a terroir because it has all the yeast and you see all these old barrels. Old barrels are prized because they're the repository of the genetic material of centuries of winemaking of this floor. So they almost have their own sort of flavor profile. They were built with really thick walls to maintain the coolness. They were built with very high ceilings and in these high ceilings, they placed high windows to allow airflow to create the freshness that they needed. They are also built with an exposure towards the Atlantic Ocean to capture that poniente air that's gonna create the right microclimate for the floor. Not only are they their own terroir, they also within the bodegas, you have different microclimates because you might have a part of the winery where it's really cool and the wines might do really well. So for example, the La Segurera Montaña Pasada comes from the coolest, wettest, dank, sort of corner because that's where the, the the grandfather always liked to store the best, most special wines that you may have floor growing for 20 years because the conditions are perfect there. Going back to the locations of the structures, this is really important because Maestro Sierra, for example, sits on a bluff. So it's interior, but it has great active floor because it's looking at the Atlantic Ocean and it receives this crazy sort of breeze. And in San Lucar, as crazy as it sounds, there's two subzones. There's Barrio Bajo and Barrio Alto. So Barrio Alto is what defines the wines of Manzanillas that we think of as wines that have a chamomile kind of aptly sort of fresh characteristic. La Cigarrera, which is the winery we import from, it's at the bottom of Barrio Bajo. In fact, it's right at the fold of this mountain range and it acts like a sail capturing all this crazy humidity. So the wines of Barrio Bajo tend to be a lot earthier, a lot more sort of bready, doughy. These are really intense, dense uh, wines.